Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching Let's Talk About vSphere Networking. In this lesson, we're going to start with a review and a primer. And the purpose here is being the first full lesson in the course, I wanted to make sure that we, you know, we all use the same terminology, the same phrasing, and understand the components that make up this kind of base vSphere networking. So we'll start with that primer. We'll talk about vSphere vSwitches and the components of a vSwitch. We'll compare and contrast some of your different vSwitch options, standard vSwitch, the distributed virtual switch, and say third-party switch like Cisco's Nexus 1000V. Then we'll talk about physical NICs. And you know, that's, that's something we do need to hit on here, talk about some of the optimizations, the options with VM direct path, which can be used with network cards, why you'd want to do that, and how you do that, and at the end, we will talk a little bit about which vSwitch is right for you, your environment, which one meets your design criteria and requirements, and give you some recommendations. So with that, let's go ahead and let's get started with the review and the primer. So why the review? Again, I want to make sure we're all using the same terms, make sure we're on the same page as a bit of a refresher. And also, because often what I see is that many server and VMware admins have a great server-side view of networking, and understand that and you know the rest of the network as we extend further up the network or use some of the more advanced features it gets a little bit more muddy and VMware and virtualization as a whole is forcing people to learn new skill sets so it's pretty common these days for people that I work with that you know they've been doing server administration OS application administration for years and years but now thanks to virtualization consolidation and we'll call it you know private cloud configuration if you want to they're now learning things about storage, storage connectivity, storage design for the back end, things that used to be kind of a separate discipline. And networking is the same way. You know, VMware admins aren't normally required to become, say, Cisco CCIEs, but they are understanding more and more about complex networking, how to connect in, spanning tree, loop avoidance, all these other things. So when we do that, you know, it pays to kind of all have the same terminology, the same framework and that's what we want to focus on. It's also what I see is pretty common is to come out of one of the courses, especially the VMware install and configure class, and understand you know, the basic vSwitches, port groups, and NIC configurations, but in a lot of cases that's where things stop, and so as we go to these more advanced features and more complex design and configurations, it helps to kind of have this review and primer again. So with that, you know, let's start walking through some of the components and the different functions. So I usually start with vSphere V switches, these virtual software switches. They are like a true switch. It's in software instead of hardware, and these V switches run on each of your vSphere hosts. And there's three different options for V switches. So you have your standard V switch. Some people call it VSS, different things. But it's your standard V switch. It's available for use in all the different licensing levels of vSphere. Then, with the Enterprise Plus license level, we have the vSphere Distributed Switch, or VDS. Now, this used to be referred to as the Distributed Virtual Switch in a lot of cases, the DVS. But with vSphere 5, VMware is kind of focused on the name, vSphere Distributed Switch, so I'll try to use that and use VDS. But do forgive me if I kind of, you know, go back to my old habits of saying DVS or Distributed Virtual Switch or something like that. Your third option are third-party switches. And honestly, right now, there's only one option here for a third-party switch, and that's Cisco's Nexus 1000V. We're not going to get too deep into that on this course. There's another course for that. But I wanted to kind of compare and contrast the three different V switches at the end of this lesson, let you figure out what fits your environment, what meets your requirements, and then you can figure out which one you want to use, the standard V switch, the vSphere distributed switch, or something like the Nexus 1000V. Every vSphere admin pretty much, you know, has used the standard vSwitch at some point. It's the basic vSwitch. When you install a new vSphere host, it's already, you know, a, a simple form of it has been created for you. So even if you plan to go full bore 100% VDS, you're still going to, you know, have to do some work on the standard switch. So a lot of that we don't rehash in this course. We're going to really focus on the vSphere distributed switch things like that and some of that carries back and forth a lot of the design you know things we talk about carries to the standard a lot of configuration carries to the standard but the future is definitely with the distributed switch if you look at the feature sets that have come with 4.1 and 5.0 and vSphere 
you'll see where VMware is putting the R&D dollars into. And I think that, you know, the vSwitch is the core of the virtual networking world. And a little bit of an aside here. So whenever I'm talking about a standard vSwitch, you know, as, as a contrast to the distributed vSwitch, I'll try to say standard vSwitch or VSS, something like that. If I just say vSwitch, like, hey, we're configuring this vSwitch, it can really mean either. And usually, you know, I'll try to make a point of that in context. So a vSwitch could be a standard vSwitch. It could be a distributed vSwitch. Or it could be, say, the Nexus 1000V is also another type of vSwitch. But in this case, you know, the generic term vSwitch, I consider the core of the virtual networking world. It's also often the case of confusion because this is where things get murky. You know, the VMware administrators get it pretty much. Your network administrators kind of understand it, but it's really where the two worlds start to kind of mix together. But it, it, to me, it's the center because it's where we do our physical NIC configurations, where we figure out how we're going to do our network design, where we implement a lot of our, you know, quality of service or rate limiting or VLAN configurations, all that stuff. So it is kind of the hub for networking here in the virtual world. And a quick word about vSwitches. vSwitches, for the most part, are like actual or physical switches, like a Cisco switch or a Nortel switch or something like that, but they are also a bit different. They are a switch in that they do switch frames, meaning if a VM needs to send some information, it packages up in a frame, gets passed out of the virtual NIC in the VM into the vSwitch, and then the vSwitch looks at it and figures out where to forward it to. Does it forward it to another VM? Does it forward it up to a physical connection out of one of the physical NICs? You know, just like a regular switch would. It also keeps track of MAC addresses. It doesn't keep track of all MAC addresses because really, if you think about it, what does a vSwitch care about? He cares about the VMs behind him. So, you know, he knows all the MAC addresses for the VMs. He doesn't really care about the MAC addresses that are on the rest of the network. His assumption is, if I don't know about it, it exists outside of this vSphere host and off it goes. So it does have kind of a MAC table, but not a full MAC table like a full-on switch would have. They also do not run things like spanning tree. So even the Cisco Nexus switch, the virtual switch, does not run the spanning tree protocol. And if you're unfamiliar with spanning tree, it's a protocol basically used to keep loops from forming in the network. Because if I send out a broadcast and I've got a loop in the network, that frame will continue to cycle around and around and around until, you know, something kills it. Spanning tree kind of does work to make sure that loops don't appear in the network. But we don't have to worry about that because we'll talk about the configuration of a vSwitch, but bottom line is it appears to the upstream switch as a host with a lot of NICs. Therefore, it doesn't participate in spanning tree, you know, negotiations or elections for what's called the root bridge. A vSphere host is just plugged into the network, and even though there's virtual switching going on in that host, it doesn't really act like a switch. There's no way to create a loop or anything like that. So it's a simpler than a full switch. And they also don't support many link aggregation features, like creating port channels and doing, say, LACP. Uh, LACP is a common industry standard protocol for configuring link aggregation between two switches or a host and a switch. They kind of negotiate out a bunch of things, make sure everybody understands on both sides, and brings up this, you know, aggregation of multiple connections. But, you know, vSphere doesn't support that. The Nexus 1000V actually does, but again, that's off to the side. But the standard vSwitch and distributed switch do not. So there's a lot of interesting little features that, you know, a full-on switch can do that, say, vSwitches can't. But it's really not limiting, it just takes away some of that automatic functionality. Here's a quick kind of diagram showing a standard vSwitch configuration. So what we've got at the top is a virtual machine. Inside the virtual machine we have two VNICs, or that guest OS sees two, you know, you know, virtualized network adapters within the VM. They can be anything, the E1000, the VNXNet, you know, VMXNet 2, 3, doesn't matter. On this host, we have two vSwitches. These would be standard vSwitches, vSwitch 0 and vSwitch 1. Now, technically, and we'll talk about it later, you can have multiple distributed virtual switches, but for this discussion, let's just assume they're standard vSwitches. Inside a vSwitch, you configure port groups. If you remember that from, you know, earlier lessons or earlier training, you know that we have a, we'll create a port group, and when we assign a virtual NIC into a VM, we have to tell it what, you know, port group it kind of quote-unquote plugs into. 
So this one, the VNIC on the left, plugs into the server network, kind of a production network, we'll say. And the VNIC on the right plugs into a dedicated backup network. Now the purpose of multiple vSwitches is often to have different physical connections or physical NICs, what we call PNICs, into each one. It kind of can simplify this traffic separation. So for here, for vSwitch 1, we have a NIC connected to a backup network. For vSwitch 0, we have multiple NICs here servicing the server network and the management network. And so what we've got are vNICs, vSwitches, port groups, and PNICs. And this shows the basic hierarchy of how these are configured. A couple of things here. Sometimes terminology within VMware or virtual networking gets a little bit weird. For example, I call these PNICs. You'll hear me refer to that. You'll see that in documentation a lot. And really refers to that physical NIC and physical NIC configuration. But when I assign a PNIC into a vSwitch, it's not called a PNIC. It's actually called a VM NIC, which I find confusing, to be honest. Because to me, a VM NIC would make more sense if it's what I actually had in a VM. Instead, we call that a VNIC. So a VNICs are in the VMs. A VM NIC is actually a physical NIC configuration in a vSwitch, and I'll show you that in the lab in a second. But just make sure we kind of understand, again, terminologies. VNIC, VM NIC, and usually when we're talking physical configuration of NICs, we'll use the term P or physical NIC. So with that, let's jump to the lab real quick, and we're going to do kind of a walkthrough of vSwitches, the uh, virtual distributed switch, show you kind of the vSwitches, port groups, VM NICs, P NICs, things like that. So we'll go ahead, move over into vCenter, and take a look there. So here we are in my lab, and we've seen this from earlier lesson, but basically it's my three host lab with a bunch of VMs. And uh, the one host we're going to look at today is Megatron, again, being a Transformers fan. Each of these hosts in my lab are close to being identical. CPUs vary slightly, memory varies slightly, depending on you know what was pricing when I when I built the host. But bottom line is that each host again has four physical network adapters in it, and so four one gig NICs. There's two on board, and then I've got a dual port card added on to each one. So if we take a look, my configuration is pretty simple. So first, let me jump to adapters. Let me move this over so we can see. So I've got four adapters. Here I've got one on board and the add-on card. You can see the speed. You can see how they're configured. I've got them configured negotiate. I don't have them hard set for speed. It shows you which switch or vSwitch they belong to. One is a virtual distributed switch and one is just standard vSwitch. Gives your Mac and all that good stuff. And also here it shows you your observed IP ranges. So if you're doing some troubleshooting, you can always come in here, or I'll show you some other places to see this, where it will show you kind of the observed range of IPs that it's seen flow in and out of the switch. Now, don't treat this as gospel. Don't assume it's 100% right. I have seen this where it shows blank or, you know, kind of here where it's zeros to 255, even when it's seen traffic. Sometimes it takes a while for these to update. Just, you know, use it as a guide. I'll, I'll put it that way. And then on the right, you can see whether it supports Wake on LAN. With my own board cards, only one supports Wake on LAN. With the add-ons, both of them do. But just kind of gives you an idea there. So again, that was you pick your host, you come to the Configuration tab, and you choose Network Adapters. Then to look at the switch or virtual switching configuration, you go to the Network Configuration here. And at the top, you have your standard switch, vSwitch, and your vSphere Distributed switch. I, this is very simple. I just built this to kind of give you an idea. Normally I run the vSphere distributed switch in the lab, but on the left you will have port groups. On the right you will have the physical adapters and you can have multiple vSwitches so we can go to add networking and again if you've done you know the courses you've seen this created a new port group and then tell it if we want to use an existing switch or create a new one. I'll just say create a new one then you can give it the name of the port group and VLANs, which we'll talk about later. And finally say finish. I don't have any available network adapters to add in here, but I could. And again, it would show it there. And you can see the vSwitch is split out. If you have multiple port groups, again, they'll be listed here. The distributed switch is a bit of a different graphical interface. And to be honest, it's sometimes annoying because especially if you have one that extends, say, down below the end of the screen. So like here, I'll click the plus and it jumps me back up. 
that's a known annoying issue <laughs> I wish they would fix. It's been that way since the original release, and it's still here in 5. But we work with it anyway. But on the left, you have all your port groups. I have one here called external for my outside network, one here for fault tolerance, one here for VM networking, etc. And on the right, you have what are called uplinks. And we'll go into very you know detailed configuration examples on the distributed switch later. But again, on the right, you have your connections. There's VM NIC 0 and VM NIC 1. We can hit the little information next to them and get a little bit of information there. For this one, we do LLDP, which is kind of the industry standard Cisco Discovery Protocol. We can get a bit of information there. Port ID, it's in port gigabit port 5, things like that. Also here, a host can belong to more than one virtual distributed switch. It can only belong to one Nexus 1000V. So if you have Nexus 1000V in your environment, a host cannot belong to two different Nexus 1000V virtual switches, but a host can absolutely belong to multiple vSphere distributed switches. So if I had a multiple or another one, and we'll talk about why you'd want to do that later, you'll have one here with this configuration, and if you scroll down, there'd be another one under it. So yes, you can absolutely do that. And again, you can pull up all sorts of information, MTU sizes, things like that about the switch. And finally here, let's talk one more thing that I meant to show is here's your VM NIC order. I told you that, you know, VMware calls them calls the physical NICs VM NICs. I wish they'd honestly call these P NICs to make a little bit more sense, but, you know, is what it is. So there's your VM NICs. So in my configuration, this is not probably best practice because I've got, you know, if I lose an interface card, I'm going to lose both connections to my vSwitch. So we'll talk about, you know, design best practices. But here, VM NIC 0, VM NIC 1 are part of the virtual dis or vSphere distributed switch. 2 and 3 are vSwitch 0. So if you think about that diagram again, these would be the PNICs connecting into the vSwitches. And then if you want to see the port groups within the vSwitches, you come here and take a look at those. And if you have virtual machines, say Untangle's a good one. Untangle is my firewall system that I use. We can edit settings on him. He's got three network adapter one, goes to the external port group. And two is goes to the VM network, which is kind of my internal. And I also have another external that is not connected that I don't use. But these are your VNICs that appear to the guest OS. So in Untangle, he sees three NICs. These get plugged into the port groups, into the respective vSwitches, which in turn can push data up through the VM NIC or PNIC, depending on what you call it. But that's it for the quick tour. Let's jump back to the slide deck. So next, let's talk about the different vNICs that we can present to the guest OSs running in a VM. So you may wonder, well, why are we doing that here? But really, this is an important concept to get. I know it's discussed in, say, the standard VMware courses and some of the basic you know, fundamentals of networking, but usually those things kind of point out, hey, you should really use VMXNet2 or VMXNet3 and, and move on. I want you to understand that there's reasons to use older, older vNIC options, uh, why you may want to do that. And if you want to go for some of the advanced VMware certifications, you really need to have a good grasp of these. So these kind of go in sort of an evolutionary order. We started with what's called the VLANCE or VLANCE, and it's an emulated AMD PCNet32 LANCE adapter. I used to use these. I had a number of these, you know, PCI cards that I would use, and, and they were popular because they were inexpensive and very widely supported by different operating systems. Everything had a Lance driver built into it or a PCNet32 driver. And that's why it was one of the original VNIC options. Pretty much everything had this and it was kind of the lowest common denominator option. It wasn't the best, it didn't do a lot of the fancy stuff, but it worked. Then VMware came out with their own what we call non-emulated offering. So this was the first one that was a specific VNIC option for VMs not based on a hardware option. It was VMXNet. So it gave you better performance and, you know, better reliability and all that, but it required a VMware driver. And so you take those two, you add it together, and you get the flexible adapter. So the flexible emulates the AMD PCNet32, but then when you load a VMXNet driver, which you can load, you know, separately or comes as part of VM tools, it flips and then becomes a VMXNet VNIC. So it gave you a way to do a standard installation of an OS, boot up using the PCNet32 driver, 
And then when the VMX net was installed, you could flip that over and get better performance. So it was a really good offering. Moving on, we have the E1000. The E1000 emulates a physical NIC. It emulates the Intel 82545EM, which is supported pretty much everywhere. This is now what I consider to be your lowest common denominator. Everything has an Intel driver. Everything has an E1000 driver. So if you install Linux, BSD, Windows, you know, probably Solaris, anything like that, it's going to support E1000, and it should function just fine. And sometimes it's still the best option. For example, I was working with some free BSD VMs the other week, and what I found was I was having problems with VMXNet 2 and 3 when I would manually install the driver. E1000 worked great, CPU load was low, and I just wasn't seeing some of the quirky things in those that I was seeing with some of the other drivers, so I just continued to run E1000, and again, You'll see that off and on, especially with older operating systems. And then we have the newer, kind of more modern VMXNet offering. So we have VMXNet 2 or VMXNet Enhanced, as it's sometimes called, which is a newer version. And it supports jumbo frames and some of the offloading to the physical NIC, so it doesn't have to be done in software. It gives you better performance. The evolution of that is VMXNet 3, which is your current reigning champion. And so he is a para-virtual NIC which features things such as multi-queue, what we call receive side scaling, so the TCP window size can be scaled up and down for better performance, and IP version 6 offloads. And again, this is a pair of virtual NIC. It's not based on anything hardware-wise, so it requires a driver. Some OSs already come with this built in, but if you install VM tools, you'll get the VMX Net 3 driver installed, and it's your best performing option for all modern operating systems. So to kind of, you know, Go back to what you learn in a lot of the other courses. If you can use VMX Net 3, that's what you want to use. But if not, you know, again, a lot of times some of the older offerings, E1000, or even I've still seen, you know, Flexible in the PC Net 32 used. It all depends on what your requirements are, what your constraints of the operating system you're installing in the guest are, things like that. But it's important to understand that evolution. A couple tips for changing the VNIC type. So in some cases, you may need to install an OS with an older VNIC type and upgrade later. Uh, often you'll do this after VM tools are installed. I've done this a number of times with Linux, with BSD, even older versions of Windows. And so, you know, it's as easy as going into the VM settings, removing the old NIC, and adding a newer NIC. But in most cases, when you do this, it's going to redetect a new device, and it's going to kind of blank any network configuration you've done. So it's pretty simple. I mean, you just go to vCenter, VI Client, select the VM, edit Remove the NIC, add the NIC, and now you've got the new one as long as the drivers are installed. But you lose some of your IP settings. So a little tip, in Windows, you can use the NetSH command. So we can do NetSH interface IP dump, and it dumps out the IP config, and we dump it into a text file like network text that I've got here. And then we can bring that back in and apply it to the interface again. And it'll just save you from retyping and misconfiguration. For things like Linux, those uh, config options are saved into text files, usually for the device, like e, you know, ETH0, ETH0, uh, BSD I'm not a big expert on, so I can't really tell you where that's stored. But for those, it's easier to kind of dump that stuff out and put it back. Windows, this the NetSH command will save you some trouble. So let's jump over to the lab real quick, and I'll do a demo of changing a VNIC type. So we'll review a deployed VM. I have an XP VM with, say, an E1000 on it how we can save out the configuration, change the VNIC type, and then restore that network configuration again. So with that, let's go ahead and jump over to the lab. Okay, so here we are in the lab. And what I've done is prepared a Windows XP system for us to play with here. It's called XP VNIC. So let's go ahead and bring up the console. And real quick, if we take a look at the VM settings, we will see we have one NIC, one network adapter, and is type flexible. So it is now running as, as the accelerated AMD networked adapter. And we're going to want to switch this over to the VMX Net 3. And if you notice, there's nothing here you can do to flip that over. Uh, there's no option to do that. The only way to do it is to remove this NIC and add another one. So let me cancel here. And I'll show you what it looks like from this side. Properties, hardware, device manager and network and VMware accelerated AMD PC net adapter so you can see that right there and the reason it's accelerated is because we have the VM tools installed and that'll make sure and flip it to basically a VMX net 
So then, let me close this. What we want to do is oh, go to Network Connections, and I'll show you the current configuration. So we'll double click IP, and we're hard set for .155, statically set for an IP. So first thing we want to do is save this information. So we're going to do that very simply here. We will use the netsh command. So that will give us our net shell. Quit out of that and we'll do netsh interface IP dump into C network text. And it's just a text file that we're going to save. So we'll go ahead and do that. Span this, well, can't expand it out, I guess, for a DOS window, but I'll show you what it looks like. And what you see here is it's nothing but com or kind of inputs that go back into the NetSH command. Something I want to point out is that it does it by name, so local area connection 2. When we switch the NICs, if it's not local area connection 2, we'll need to fix one or the other. Rename the one in Windows or go in here in the text file. But you can see it dumped everything out, it has our IP, our gateway, and our DNS. So back over here, we'll go up to the VM settings, edit. Network adapter 1, remove it. I do this as a two-step process. I've done this before where I do multiple steps and remove NICs, and I've actually crashed an XP machine doing that. So we see the little uh, notification come up and said, you know, that the NIC was gone, and there it is. So we come back, VM, edit settings, add Ethernet, and we can now do VMX Net 3 because the tools are installed. And we'll go down to VM Network, Connected Power, and Next, Finish, and OK. So we'll wait for the hardware to be plugged in, and there we go. Oh, I have it up on another console. Do an Edit, Properties, IP, and it's set for DHCP. And we can see that here. Yep, .179. So we got lucky. It's local area connection 2, same as the other one. If it wasn't, you can tap this, rename this to match, or again, kind of bring this up in Editor Notepad and change the file. But since they match, that's good. We'll just do netsh-c interface, and the file name is network.txt. Give it a second to import the settings, and it should flip it back over. IP config. And our network settings now match. 155 has got the right gateway. If we do all, we have the correct DNS server. So that's it. You know, this will save you a minute. It's not a big deal, but if you have a more in-depth configuration or multiple network adapters or you just don't want to accidentally fat finger anything, you can use these scripts. But the point of this is to show you that to upgrade that virtual NIC, you have to remove the old one, add the new one, and make sure the drivers are on there, and then you're good to go. So I think that's it for this demo. Let's go back over to the slide deck. And now let's talk about physical NICs or PNICs. Choice of your physical NIC depends on your requirements and what your networking options are. You know, the most common that I still see out in the field by far is still 1 gig connections. Uh, multiple 1 gig connections, and by multiple I mean 6 or 8 or even 10, are very common in vSphere hosts. 10 gig is becoming much more popular. Uh, the hold up here is really, you know, getting those network switches 10 gig capable as that adds a great deal of expense. But as people are kind of, you know, cycling those top of rack, end of row, or even core switches, we're seeing 10 gig become the predominant choice. And, you know, it's like that for a number of reasons. For, you know, reducing cabling, reducing NICs, you know, I can put 8 1 gig NICs to a vSphere host, but 2 10 gigs kills that. You know, it's, it's way faster than the 8 gigabit. And if you know anything about how the networking and channels and ether channels and port channels and all that work, you know, you don't really get load balancing across those. And we'll talk about those later. But, you know, 210 gigs gives you much better throughput than a bunch of 1 gig connections. So you've got 1 gigs, you've got 10 gig ethernet, and we're starting to see a lot of people use what we call CNAs or converged network adapters. And what these do is they're a single port, a single cable that does 10 gig Ethernet as well as fiber channel over Ethernet in a unified solution. The cool thing is, is when you put one of these in a server, it looks like a standard NIC and a standard eight fiber channel HBA. You know, to the vSphere admin, it's no different than if you'd put a network card 
and a Fiber Channel HPA in the server. It's just all in one over single connection. So we're starting to see those become more and more popular as people go to this what we call unified you know, infrastructure with Ethernet and storage running on one fabric. So a couple of things here. One is suggested to spread connectivity across onboard and add-on cards. So servers today come with at least two and sometimes four onboard gig or 10 gig connections. And usually we'll see people put in, you know, dual port or quad port add-on cards, which is just fine. But we'll talk about this in a minute with design and really talk about it in the, I guess, the distributed switching section. But you want to make sure and spread out things across both of those. You don't want that onboard quad port to go bad and take all your NFS connections with it. You want to make sure and do things with, you know, redundant connections across the cards and across the onboard or internal ports. Some physical NICs offer acceleration and optimization options. So these things are like NetQ or VMDQ virtual machine device queues. And VMDQ is a hardware technology that offloads network I.O. management from the hypervisor, in this case ESXi. NetQ is VMware software that provides a NIC with multiple receive queues for different VMs. So it's basically each different VM gets its own receive queue and therefore is kind of protected from other VM traffic. And combined, they provide much greater throughput for 10 gig NICs. And so some of these features you'll see on 10 gig NICs, better buffering, better receive windows, better receive buffers and queues, because it's required to maintain speed at 10 gig. Some cards also support TCP offload engines, or what we call tow cards. And really, tow can mean different things. vSphere supports TCP segment offload, TSO, and large receive offload, LRO. And, you know, TSO requires support in the guest with the enhanced VMX net or newer, as well as the physical NIC. And by default, it's enabled. You don't have to go in and enable anything. When the driver loads, it looks for what it can support and, you know, provides a functionality. And there are some advanced tow features that vSphere does not support. There's some that are on, say, the iSCSI hardware cards that are only supported with very specific cards. And my suggestion is to just look at the... Uh, VMware hardware compatibility list for, for which iSCSI cards are supported, but any good enterprise level card will do things like TSO and LRO, and again, they are enabled by default. And there's also physical NIC virtualization. Some physical NICs allow for creation of what we call virtual NICs. You can take one port on a physical NIC and subdivide it into a bunch of virtual ports that appear to vSphere as different physical NICs. Very useful for doing, you know, flow control, rate limiting, different QoS, different segmentation of traffic. And it's very popular in Blades due to limited I.O. expansion. So I do a lot of Cisco UCS. If you're interested in UCS, I did the train signal course on that. Do a, I love UCS. And they have what are called the VIC or virtual interface cards, the M81KR and the VIC-1280. So you can take a port on a VIC-1280 and slice, or an M81KR, and slice it up into 10 or 20 or 30 Ethernet ports. You can do the same thing with HBAs for fiber channel storage, have multiple HBAs. The point of this is, is that, you know, often we will do this so that we create a virtual NIC for vMotion, a virtual NIC for fault tolerance, a virtual NIC for NFS or iSCSI. And we can do things where we apply rate limiting, quality of service, all sorts of other priorities and queuing, within the management of the blade system that's better than what we get with VMware. So UCS has the VIC adapters, HP has Flex 10, Intel has, you know, SRIOV, which is not supported in VMware yet, but is kind of an industry standard way to do this. Cisco is releasing uh, interface cards that will work with non-Cisco servers. So there's a lot of things that, that are coming along in this department. But at the end of the day, what it really does is gives you flexibility without having to add a bunch of physical adapters and ports. To the vSphere admin, they still look like your regular old NICs or ports or capabilities, so you don't really have to do things differently. Just be aware that those eight different ports you see in VMware may not truly be eight. So, you know, you may only have 10 or 20 gigabit of throughput, not 80 gigabit of throughput. But again, in most circumstances, 20 is plenty. If you really want to get the last, squeeze that last bit of performance out of VMware, we can do what is called VM Direct Path. And so the hypervisor in, you know, with VMware has very low overhead, usually in the very low single digits, especially for I.O. VMware gets better and better and better with every version. 
they release statistics, you know, 3, 3, 5, 4, 0, 4, 1, 5, and it just shows that the overhead gets less and less and less. But there are still cases where you run into that you may just want to squeeze out that last bit of control, or a VM may need direct access to a NIC for a particular reason. And so there is a feature called VM Direct Path. And really, VM Direct Path is something that allows you to pass through a PCI device to a VM and give that guest OS direct access to it. So it doesn't have to be just for NICs. You can use it for storage controllers. You can use it for other adapters, you know, depending on what the level is, and there's not a big guarantee on what's going to work and what's not. So usually we try to stick to NICs and storage adapters. But there are some requirements. So first, the system that the vSphere is running on must support either Intel VTD for Intel systems or AMD IOMMU for, of course, AMD systems. So the CPU has to support it, the chipset has to support it, has to be enabled in BIOS, you know, and therefore vSphere has to have full support. VMs, here's the downside, VMs must have a full memory reservation. So due to the way that the uh, devices are passed through, if I have a virtual machine and I give it 4 gigs of RAM, and I want to use VM Direct Path, I have to do a memory reservation for that machine for 4 gigs of RAM. So any machine that you do VM Direct Path with must have a full memory reservation. It's not an option. On all platforms except UCS, Cisco UCS currently, you cannot vMotion a VM that's doing VM Direct Path. The reason being is, if I'm attached to a physical device on that server, how do I vMotion that VM to another server where I'm not guaranteed that physical NIC is, or I'm not guaranteed access to it, things like that. So you've got to make sure that, you know, it is capable and there, and it just can't do that. So you're not allowed to vMotion. UCS is a different animal. Due to the way that it does abstraction of its hardware to the VM and integration with VMware, it does allow this. And it uses that virtual I.O. connectivity we talked about a minute ago where I create virtual network adapters and interfaces and it does that. It basically, when it vMotions VM from host 1 to host 2, it disconnects that virtual, you know, hardware device from, from the device on the first host and reattaches it and creates it again on the second host. So it does a little bit of magic, but that's the only platform that allows it. The guest OS must support past hardware. So if you have a brand new shiny NIC and your old version of Windows Server doesn't have a driver for it, even though vSphere 5 does, too bad. vSphere 5 doesn't load a driver for that device, the guest OS does. So that guest OS must support that device. And configuration, the initial configuration require, requires rebooting of the vSphere host. So when you enable this, it's going to say, hey, I need to reboot vSphere to take control of that device, and you're going to have to put it in maintenance mode and reboot the device. And here we have a diagram showing VM Direct Path. And this is a variation on the diagram we saw earlier. We have our VM, we have our vSwitch, our two PNICs, our port groups. But here we have a PNIC in the VM. And we do this because we have directly passed it through to the VM, bypassing the hypervisor. The NIC we pass through is not part of a vSwitch. It's not a VM NIC or anything like that. It's directly passed through and bypasses everything. So you get pretty much true hardware speed and hardware capability. So now let's jump over to the lab. Uh, we'll configure VM Direct Path. So I'll show you how to look at the VM Direct Path capable devices, configure a NIC to be passed through to a VM, enable the VM for VM Direct Path, and show the capability in the guest OS. So with that, let's go ahead and jump on over to the lab. So here we are again, back in the lab. And what I've done this time is I have a, an XP machine called VM Direct that we're going to use for the VM Direct pass through demo. And we're going to do this on the host Optimus. So first thing we need to do is configure Optimus. So we'll go up to optimus.nashlab.local. And to configure VM Direct Path, you go to the Configuration tab. Then you come down to Advanced Settings. And it's going to tell you there's a warning here. Basically it says don't do something stupid like pass through the RAID controller that your machine boots off of. Because if you do that, your machine isn't going to boot very well. So you know, don't pass through the RAID card if it's holding your LUN for a boot or anything that the machine actually needs. We're just going to do a NIC, so we shouldn't have to worry about that. It says no device is currently enabled, so we need to enable devices. So let me move this out of the way. Then we'll click Configure Pass-Through. It's going to give you a list of all the PCI devices that it sees. If you notice, things like HBAs, things like the VM NICs that are actually being used and assigned have the names beside them, so hopefully you won't choose the wrong one. 
I left two Intel NICs here and here unused for pass-through demo. So I'll go ahead and check this one. It's going to say device as a dependent device. Do you want to also mark that? And we'll say yeah, and it's usually the PCI Express yep, root port. So you'll see that it got checked here. It's a requirement for this device. So we're sure that's what we want. And you can look at the PCI IDs and things like that to confirm it. And we say OK. Task completes. We do a refresh, give it a second. It should pop up and then show the device. There it is. Changes made to some of the devices below will not take effect until the host is restarted. So the first thing we need to do is restart this host. So are there any VMs running on here? Yes, my VM Direct is running on there. So we'll move him off for a minute. Say OK, 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 and let him vMotion. And then we'll right-click Optimus over here, and we'll tell it to reboot. Once he reboots and comes back up, we'll continue on. Okay, now that we're back, let's go ahead and move this VM back over. And we'll go back to the Configuration tab and Advanced Settings. So there we are. Unit Edit, you know, see the other things that we've done, take a look at those. But from this point, we're pretty much good to go. Now that the machine's moved over, let's go ahead and we will edit settings. First thing we want to do in resources is set a memory reservation. Reserve all guest memory. So we'll do that. Say OK. And the next thing we need to do is actually power this system down. So you can't do a VM, VM direct path add while the system is running. So we'll do this real quick. Do a shutdown guest. And one reason I like to do demos with XP is it shuts down very quickly. So we'll give that just a second, and we should be able to add a device. Okay, now that it's turned off, we'll go back to Edit Settings, Add a Device, and we're going to do a PCI Device, say Next. And it's going to give you a list of all the devices you've selected for pass-through, and we've only done one, so there we go. Also, I think one thing that I didn't mention, the presence of PCI PCI device passer will prevent the use of many commands on VMs. It will not be able to be suspended or have snapshots taken or restored. So that's one I don't think I mentioned until I saw that right there that reminded me. So no snapshots with the machine on VM direct path. So that's another downside. So no vMotion in most cases, no snapshots, and you have to do a full memory reservation. And also it says here, uh, adding one will automatically set the minimum reservation. You don't have to do it manually, but I, I just out of habit do that. Then we'll say finish. We'll say OK. And we'll power the system back on. Bring up, let's see, my DRS is currently set for uh, manual mode, so it's going to prompt me, which can't really go anywhere else since I'm doing VM, path, VM direct path, but, you know, there we go. Let's go ahead and bring up the console. And then it should see it pop up and start installing drivers. There we go. Just proves my point that you need guest OS support for anything that you pass through. Uh, not installed. That's fine. But if we had a driver for it, we go into here, properties, hardware, back to device manager, we will see this Ethernet controller and PCI slot gives you the device and information. But if we had an Intel driver, it would have installed it and brought it in as a NIC, just like if this was running on hardware and we had that Intel NIC installed. Again, to kind of reiterate something here, if we want to do snapshots, see if it'll shouldn't let me. Yep, it's going to give me an error. Operation not allowed in current state, and if I try to get smart and vMotion this guy here, yeah, it's not going to let me. PCI device 0 uses backing, which is not accessible. So we do have VM direct path enabled. It's passing through that device, but it does limit us. We can't do vMotion, we can't do snaps, and we have to do a memory reservation.
which kind of limits our memory overcommit, especially if you start doing this on a lot more VMs. But in certain circumstances, it's very, very useful. Okay, that's it for the demo. Let's jump back over to the slide deck. And then your virtual switching options. So alluded to in this lesson, there are multiple virtual switching solutions or options. First, you have your standard vSwitch. It's the most common, very well known. It's included in all licensing levels. It can be simple. It can be complex. It all depends on the environment. Some places I'll see have a single vSwitch. Most have at least two, sometimes three on each host. You know, they may have one for storage, one for, say, vMotion, one for all the VM connections, port groups, and NICs. It just depends. But, you know, it can be simple, can be more complex. But it's not seeing new features very often. If you look at the feature additions from, say, vSphere 4, 4, 1, 5, you'll notice that all the cool new toys are going into the distributed switch. So the standard vSwitch, it is what it is. It can be simple. If you have a lot of hosts, it can be cumbersome, but it just comes down to what you want to get out of it. If you have Enterprise Plus, I highly suggest you look at the distributed switch. It requires Plus, but it's, it's usually much simpler and easier to manage, and it's getting all the new features such as network I.O. control. You can do ingress and egress rate limiting. You can do private VLANs. You can do a lot of other really neat stuff with it that we'll talk about more in depth in the VDS lesson. But if you can use this, if you have Enterprise Plus, I highly suggest you do it. And Cisco has the Nexus 1000V. It's currently the only third-party switch offered. And it's created by Cisco. It's a software switch that runs in and on the vSphere host. And it requires Enterprise Plus licensing because it does kind of tie in or use hooks for the vSphere distributed switch. It's, it's got some pros and cons, right? So it provides features that are not available in the standard V switches or even the DVS. You can put access control lists on different VMs or port groups. So just like on a real Cisco switch, I can do an IP access list. It supports LACP, link aggregation control protocol, for when I want to do trunks, port channels, that sort of thing. It makes it simpler and it has some more advanced load balancing options, more hashing options, more things like virtual uh, port channels, which allow me to connect to more than one physical switch, more than one physical switch that are not talking to each other, and still act like that's a single port channel. So it makes failover easier, load balancing easier. It has better QoS and queuing, more security options like ARP inspection, IP source guard, and DHCP snooping, which are very popular for virtual desktop environments. And it does encapsulated remote span or ER spam. The VDS does port mirroring and it will allow you to mirror traffic coming to or from one VM to another VM or out an external interface on the host. But ER span does even more in that I can say, okay, I want you to capture all the traffic going in and out of the VM and send it to this IP address way across the other side of the network. So it's more flexible and capable. There's other features and in in things, you know, for a full comparison, I've got the URL right there. Some things are big, some things are very minor. Just look at it and see how it fits your environment. So which vSwitch is for you? Well, it's all about requirements and constraints. I get this question all the time. In fact, I just had it the other day. You know, customer want to know, should I use the Nexus 1000V? And it was a simple question like that. Well, I can't answer that question without knowing more about what you're doing, what you want to do, where you're going in the future. So it kind of depends. Sometimes licensing dictates it very simply. If you have Enterprise and you're not going to buy Enterprise Plus, you do standard vSwitches. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you have Plus, then you do have the option for the distributed switch or the 1000V. The vSphere distributed switch is very, very powerful. vSphere 5 added a lot of requested features and narrowed the gap for features on a lot of things that people requested between it and the 1000V. So my first suggestion is take a hard look at the comparison table I mentioned on the last slide and see where you fit with your requirements. The 1KV is the most features, there's no question about it. It's the most extensible. Cisco has things like their new virtual ASA firewall. They have virtual security gateway, which is a multi-tenancy software firewall. They have virtual WAS, you know, which is their wide area application services and acceleration product set that kind of plugs into the 1000V. It's really cool. It plugs in. These things can push down rules and, and information and metadata to each of the vSphere hosts so they make intelligent networking decisions without having to run back to the control plane but, you know, 
not everything, you know, or should I say, everything comes at a cost. I usually recommend people have Cisco knowledge in-house because the 1000V runs NXOS or Nexus OS, so you want to have some of that on staff. It's deployed in multiple components. It is not integrated into vCenter. It talks to vCenter for display back and, you know, config information, but all configuration itself of the switch, like adding a port group, is either done at the command line in NXOS or using a Cisco tool like Data Center Network Manager. It's Again, it's multiple components. You install a piece of software called the Virtual Ethernet Module on each vSphere host. And then you have what's called the control plane or the kind of the brains who manage the configuration called the Virtual Supervisor Module that runs either as an appliance or actually a pair of appliance VMs in a cluster. Or you can buy a physical appliance called a Nexus 1010. So there is a good deal of step up in complexity for the 1000V. But my recommendation is start back at the comparison matrix, see what your requirements are and where you fit, and then look to see if you want to take on the additional complexity. So that's it for this lesson. We uh, covered a lot of stuff here. We started off with a review and primer where we talked about vSphere vSwitches, the components and things like that, the different vSwitches. We talked about, you know, the DVS, the standard vSwitches, whether they're real switches or not and what they do. Went into physical NICs. Talked about what your options are there, acceleration, you know, net queue, your toe offloads, things like that, what you need to look at when buying network adapters. And then, you know, we looked at VM Direct Path. I did a demo, showed you how you can pass through a NIC directly to a VM for the best possible performance. And, you know, it comes at a cost like everything that I talk about. But, you know, you have to do a memory reservation. You can't do vMotion in most cases. You can't do snapshots, etc. So not a use case that most people take advantage of, especially for the majority of their VMs, but if you need it, hey, it's there for your support. And finally, we kind of did a quick compare and contrast on the different vSwitches. Standard vSwitch, vSphere Distributed Switch, and the Nexus 1000V. Showed you where you get your comparison matrix. Gave you a little bit of insight into which one. My recommendation, if you have Enterprise Plus, look really hard at the Distributed Switch. Look really hard at the comparison matrix and see where you fall. If you're on enterprise or lower licensing, you have to use the standard switches. It's really something that VMware is doing. They're putting a lot of this R&D and new development into the Enterprise Plus features. You know, whether you think that's good, whether you think that's bad, it, it's just the way it is. So that's it for this lesson. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.